together. So if you talk about oliguria in simple terms, it's a reduction in urine output. And this is an important marker uh, of renal hypoperfusion and evolving acute tubular injury. And this is one of the very first biomarkers of acute kidney injury, which was found very long, very a long time back, even in 100 to 200 AD. Uh, uh, at that time, also people knew that oliguria is a biomarker of acute kidney injury. And over the years, all the classification systems of acute kidney injury have used oliguria as a criterion to diagnose. Uh, uh, AKI. However, it, you, we must be very, very careful when interpreting urine output because there are so many variables attached to it uh, and that you need to have a good idea by, about what are the factors that govern urine output. So normally, when a person with, when, who's taking a normal diet, they generate about 600 milliosmos per day of solute waste products. And this needs to be excreted uh, in the urine following metabolism. So if you have a normal kidney function, normal tubular function, and if you assume that you are getting the maximal ADH stimulation in a day, the person would generally require a minimum of around 500 milliliters per day of urine production to excrete this osmotic load. With that being said, so what do we, how do we define oliguria? So generally, uh, uh, the consensus is that urine output of less than 0.5 milliliters per kg per hour for more than six hours. And if you are having this low urine output for six hours, that is considered as a significant reduction in urine output and oliguria. However, this differs depending on the age of the uh, person. So if you take about take infants, your definition is different. If you take children, your definition is different. And if you uh, consider adults, your definition becomes different. If you take the intensive care patients or the critically ill patients, more than 50% of your intensive care patients have at least one episode of oliguria. And some of the studies have shown that oliguria itself results in higher morbidity and mortality, which makes it very important for us to identify. So before we move on to uh, uh, the, uh, the, the presentation, I'd like to give you a few case scenarios to uh, look at. So this is the first one patient, a 68 year old female patient, a known hypertensive, admits uh, uh, following a stroke. The routine manage, medical management is done in the hospital, a catheter is inserted and, and uh, uh, on examination, apart from features of the stroke, he's well, afebrile, conscious and rational. Blood pressure is relatively stable at 140-90. On examination, however, there is a palpable bladder. And in the monitoring charts, when they monitor, the urine output is stated as 10 milliliters of urine output over the last six hours. So, this could be considered as oliguria. So what might be the cause for this? We take another presentation, the same age, same gender, a patient with hypertension, this time a different person admitting with following a fall and fracture of the right neck of femur. Examination, the patient's afebrile, pale, conscious and rational. And there is a large volume bleeding into the thigh that they notice once the patient gets admitted. Blood pressure is slightly low. It's low at 80 by 60 millimeters of mercury and the patient is tachycardic with a pulse rate of 130 ml, 30 beats per minute. And here again on, on monitoring, they notice that the patients only passed 10 milliliters of urine over the last six hours. So what might be causing this oliguria? Another case scenario, a 68 year old female, similar age and gender, known patient with hypertension uh, admitting following reduced urine output for two days. She's afebrile. There is a vasculitis, vasculitic rash involving bilateral lower limbs. On examination, patient is noted to be pale, 
with lower limb edema, conscious and rational with an elevated blood pressure of 170 by 100. Again, they notice the urine output's low, around 10 ml uh, uh, over the last six hours. And the next scenario is, again, a 68-year-old female patient, known hypertensive, Again, this time admitting following an abdom following abdominal distension for about one month's duration and was diagnosed with a cervical carcinoma. In examination, she's a febrile, pale, conscious, rational, blood pressure is elevated at 160-90. Again, the urine output is low over the last six hours. So there's a you know same sort of same you know age same gender same background medical history but with different clinical presentations with oliguria and we need to know how to identify these patients and understand what's actually going on in these patients so if you talk about oliguria it could actually be physiological and pathological so what i mean by physiological is that the problem is not actually in the kidney somewhere else in the body and physiologically, body tries to adapt to these changes, which results in oliguria. So the commonest cause you would uh, know would be hypovolemia for this. And there are different mechanisms that gets activated in the body to cause oliguria. On the other hand, there will be pathological problems in the kidney or in the surrounding structures, which again leads to oliguria, which we'll discuss at the second part of our uh, discussion. So, so first we'll discuss about the physiological causes that cause actually oliguria and in order to discuss this it's important that we refresh our memory on how urine is produced and what actually causes oliguria. So urine formation is mainly dependent on three processes. So it's your glomerular filtration, tubular reabsorption and tubular secretion. And you have been taught uh, about in detail about these uh, physiological processes in your physiology days. If you talk about the glomerulus, the, the, uh, the, what mainly governs what gets filtered is your hydrostatic and oncotic pressures that works around in your glomerulus. And if you can remember, in the glomerulus, glomerulus there's hydrostatic pressure pushing fluid out and then there's an oncotic pressure which is keeping fluid within the glomerulus. And from the Bowman's capsular side, there is a pressure, hydrostatic pressure that is pushing fluid back into the glomerulus. Or uh, pushing the sense that is against fluid coming out. So at the end of the day, there is roughly about a negative filtration pressure of around 10 millimeters of mercury that actually governs the filtrate. However, this glomerular filtrate is regulated by many intrinsic and extrinsic mechanisms. The myogenic mechanisms, the tubular glomerular feedback mechanism being the predominant intrinsic mechanism. And from outside the kidney, you have the nervous system, the hormones that actually regulates the glomerular filtration rate. If you talk about the intrinsic mechanisms of myogenic mechanism, how it operates, for example, if your blood pressure suddenly shoots up, this results in that, uh, the stretching of the blood vessels, the smooth muscle cells of the afferent arterioles, which opens up cationic channels and results in depolarization of these channels. And this results in a large influx of calcium into these smooth muscle cells, which causes intracellular increase in cell calcium in these smooth muscle cells, which causes vasoconstriction and that reduces the amount of blood that actually gets transmitted to the glomerulus. So it actually controls a significantly higher blood pressure, pushing a lot of blood into the capillaries. The next glomerular feedback mechanism is your juxtaglomerular feedback mechanism. So if you remember your anatomy histology days, you uh, there, so this is your glomerulus, you have the Afferent arteriole coming in, the efferent arteriole going out, and then the tubules, the tubules uh, are, are going in this direction. And when you talk about the distal tubule, there is a place which gets specialized into an area called macula densa cells. And all this, all these three 
together is what you call the juxtaglomerular apparatus. So how does this act in controlling the uh, uh, or urine production or the glomerular filtrate? So for example, if a person's arterial pressure drops, then the glomerular hydrostatic pressure goes down, the GFR reduces, and this results in reduced sodium chloride uh, uh, transport to the distal tubules. And that gets that stimulates the macular densa cells and the juxtaglomerular apparatus, which results in increased renin, increased angiotensin II secretion, thereby causing different arteriolar vasoconstriction. And what does this does it? It increases. So when the efferent arterial gets constricted, the intraglomerular pressure goes up, thereby it tries to increase the glomerular filtration rate. At the same time, uh, the, the stimulation also vasoconstricts the afferent arterioles, uh, sorry, vasodilates the afferent arterioles, thereby trying to get more and more blood to flow into the uh, glomerulus, thereby increasing the amount of filtrate. So this is a mechanism that helps to keep the urine output, increases the glomerular filtration, keep maintains the urine output at times of reduced perfusion due to hypotension. If you talk about the extrinsic mechanism outside the kidney governing these, for example, the neural mechanisms play a major role. For example, if your blood pressure drops and that actually results in reduced perfusion to the kidney, thus it stimulates the sympathetic nervous system and results in vasoconstriction if the afferent arterioles reduces glomerular filtration, thereby trying to uh, increase the blood, keep the blood volume in the body high. So there, the body is not worried about trying to maintain a glomerular filtration rate initially. It tries to maintain blood pressure, but as a result, what happens is you would have a low glomerular filtration rate and that can result in oliguria. Similarly, hormonal mechanisms also act like this. So I'm only going to concentrate on this first angiotensin II. Anything that stimulates angiotensin II uh, uh, secretion will cause uh, uh, a reduction in the glomerular filtration rate. So for example, any circumstance which reduces the general blood volume in the body, significant hypotension is going to cause more and more stimulation of angiotensin II which constricts both afferent and efferent arterioles, thereby reducing the GFR. So what I've been trying to explain to you is that there are many mechanisms in, a, in, in normal situation, under normal circumstances where the kidney is normal, but when there are problems happening elsewhere in the body, for example, hypotension, low blood volumes, and the kidneys where things uh, start getting acted upon, and you end up with the oliguria because the body is trying to compensate for the abnormalities. At the same time, apart from that, the water balance becomes very important. So that acts separately. So the body tries to maintain osmolality between tightly between an osmotic range of 285 to 290 milliosmoles per kilogram of water. And this is mainly governed by the antidiuretic hormones. So generally, uh, the volume can vary, urine volume can vary in a person between 0.5 to 25 liters per day. And this is apart from some of the mechanisms I discussed before, this is also mainly governed by the amount of antidiuretic hormone secretion. And as you can remember, antidiuretic hormones are secreted by, uh, it's, it's uh, from the hypothalamus pituitary axis and uh, comes into the circulation from the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland. And this is stimulated by a lot of uh, things, mainly plasma osmolality, where if your osmolality is increased, the body tries to preserve more and more water from the kidney and the antidiuretic hormone increases. If you have low blood volume, your antidiuretic hormones increase. If you are hypotensive, your antidiuretic hormones levels increase. There are many things that stimulate your ADH secretion. So this is a nice graph depicting what happens when you're with uh, osmolality changes. 
So this is your normal osmolarity range from 280 to 290. And you can see as your osmolarity goes up, they are, uh, your vasopressin or your antidiuretic hormone levels then start going up because it is trying to now maintain, keep more, preserve more and more water in the body to minimize the osmotic shifts. So when that happens, you can see the urine osmolarity goes up as well because now more and more water is being reabsorbed by the tubules and the urine gets concentrated and the patient's urine output also reduces. So, and this vasopressin acts through many aquaporin receptors. However, the, com the most important one is your aquaporin two receptors in the collecting duct. And that is where most of this uh, uh, vasopressin acts on the kidney, thereby uh, reabsorbing more and more water, resulting in low urine output, that is your oliguria. So what I've tried to show you is that oliguria can happen under normal situation, normal, uh, when, when the kidney functions are normal, still you can get oliguria because of mechanisms that are operating in the body and the kidney related uh, factors try to uh, compensate for the body abnormalities. On the other hand side, when, you're, when you have problems in the kidneys, that will also result in oliguria. So these pathological conditions actually lead to acute kidney injury. And when you have oliguria, that becomes a marker of acute kidney injury. So what do we mean by acute kidney injury? So the definitions used are these. So you can go with the creatinine cutoff for your acute kidney injury diagnosis, or as of as for today's topic, you can there is a definition where we use a urine output as well, and it is defined as reduction in urine output of less than 0.5 milliliters per kg power for more than six hours. So all these conditions where acute kidney injury happens, this results in oliguria in most of these conditions and in the definition of and, and when you are trying to identify the causes of acute kidney injury you classify them as pre-renal causes, renal causes or post-renal causes. So pre-renal causes are the most common forms of acute kidney injury which results in oliguria and here the problem is not in the kidney it's it's in a place prior to uh, the kidney and this is where this your the physiological mechanisms that I uh, discussed comes into picture there are conditions causing pre-renal AKI physiological mechanisms gets activated and as a compensatory mechanism you end up with oliguria initially these physiological mechanisms are compensatory however if you don't correct them or if if you don't correct them very early then this will result in uh, permanent damage or more severe damage. And this will result in severe hypoperfusion to the kidney and leads to acute tubular injury necrosis in these patients. So what are the commonest causes? Hypovolemia is one of the most common causes of pre-renal AKI, where it could be secondary to hemorrhage, GI losses following vomiting or diarrhea episodes, or skin losses like significant burns. Apart from that, other causes which results in any low cardiac output states like in your heart failure, valvular heart disease, any condition that causes significant systemic vasodilatation like in sepsis and anaphylaxis, any condition that causes significant vasoconstriction, especially afferent vasoconstriction where there's a high amount of catecholamines in the system, contrast nephropathy, Impaired renal autoregulation if you are taking an SAIDs, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, or conditions like hepatorenal syndrome, where there is a lot of splanchnic vasodilatation, which results in hyperperfusion. All these are causes of pre renal acute kidney injury, where the body compensatory mechanisms, which I mentioned, results in oliguria. If you move on to intrinsic renal causes of AKI, we can divide it depending on the part of the kidney that has been affected. So it could affect the glomerulus, it could affect the tubules and the interstitium, 
or it could affect the blood vessels. And depending on where it affects, there are different causes. And the clinical manifestations of these could also vary. I'm not going to go into details of different causes and their manifestations as it is beyond the, uh, the lecture topic today. However, over the next couple of years, you will be learning in detail about the specific common conditions that causes intrarenal acute kidney injury. However, just to uh, briefly discuss, if you talk about the glomerulus, so primary glomerular diseases or inflammatory conditions, for example, conditions like lupus, systemic vasculitis, can affect the glomerulus and give rise to acute kidney injury. So in this sort of patients, the way the, the, the glomerulus gets damaged and that is the reason why the urine output goes down. Similarly, if you talk about tubular interstitial conditions like nephrotoxins, such as uh, the, your medications like NSAIDs, certain antibiotics, rhabdomyolysis, myeloma, all these conditions can directly affect the tubules and damage the tubules, resulting in oliguria and AKA. And if you talk about blood vessels, conditions like thrombotic microangiopathies, atherembolic causes, antiphospholipids, all these causes, blockages of the intrarenal vasculature, resulting in reduced perfusion, low GFR, leading to oliguria and AKI. And it is self-explanatory, and you can see that depending on the etiology, the way the clinical there will be other clinical manifestations apart from oliguria, which will guide us to the underlying etiology of these patients. The next group of causes that gives rise to oliguria and AKI is your post-renal causes. That is, following uh, the parenchyma of the kidney, for after the pel pelvis and beyond that. So renal stone diseases becomes one of the commonest causes where these stones can go and obstruct the pelvis, the ureters, and the bladder sometimes, causing post-obstruction. Prostatomegaly with blood outflow obstruction is another common condition which you can uh, identify giving rise to post renal AKI. Malignant infiltration, for example, like a person with cervical cancers, uterine cancers, where it can actually infiltrate, in, uh, sorry, and ovarian uh, cancers, which can infiltrate into the uh, ureters and cause obstructions. And also can neurogenic bladder where the bladder cannot contract properly and there is a large residual volume which will cause a back pressure on the kidney. These are also some causes of post-renal acute kidney injury and can result in oliguria as well. So what are the symptoms of these conditions associated with oliguria in these patients? And as in it is self-explanatory, it depends on the underlying etiology and the related complications of AKI. And again, it will be very difficult for me to cover all causes and their different signs and symptoms in today's presentation. However, just to highlight a few examples. So for example, if a person is hypovolemic, so you're actually anticipating a pre-renal cause for an acute kidney injury. And there the patients will clinically talk about the increased thirst, and there might be a history of diarrhea, vomiting, or maybe even blood loss that is resulting in hypovolemia. And on examination, these patients might be dehydrated, they might have dry mucous membranes. Blood pressure will reveal that the patient's hypotensive, peripheral, hammy, and cold, and they will have delayed capillary refilling. So these are some of the other associated symptoms of with oliguria that will guide us to think, okay, the oliguria is likely secondary to hypovolemia. Then if you consider intrinsic causes like vasculitis, where this would give rise to an intrinsic uh, cause of acute kidney injury and oliguria, they will have other symptoms like hematuria, high blood pressure, depending on the type of vasculitis, body rashes, and other system involvements. For example, if you're talking about antiglomerular basement membrane disease, or if you're talking about anchor-associated vasculitis, there might be lung involvement, pulmonary hemorrhages associated with that, and that would guide us in the direction of the underlying cause. So how do we investigate oliguria? So there are three basic 
cleaner related in investigations that all patients with a suspected kidney injury should have. The first one is to assess the kidney function and for that you need to do a serum creatinine assessment which would give us a rough idea about the functioning of the kidneys. The urine flow report also becomes very important because depending on the type of urinary sediment it helps us to identify the underlying etiology. For example, if we are thinking about pre-renal causes of AKI, there are you get a urine, uh, what we call a bland urinary sediment. Where you can expect some proteins, but you will not expect an active sediment. Where active sediment means red cells, significant number of red cells, dysmorphic red cells, red cell cast will not be there. However, if you are thinking about intrinsic causes of oliguria and AKI, so in conditions like vasculitis, there you would expect an active urinary sediment where you get a lot of red cells, significant number of dysmorphic red cells, red cell casts. So that will also help us to differentiate what might be the underlying cause. And then an ultrasound scan, kidney ureter bladder is a mandatory test because in one way it helps us to exclude any post-obstructive causes where any condition that causes obstruction distal to the kidney, whether it's secondary to renal stones, blood outflow obstructions, you will see evidence of this obstruction in the means of hydronephrosis and hydrourea. So that is one importance of always doing an ultrasound scan. And at the same time, the uh, sizes and the appearance of the ultrasound scan, we can get a rough estimate as to see whether this patient has underlying chronic kidney disease, or whether this is purely an acute kidney injury. So those are three mandatory investigations in any patient who's presenting with oliguria that we need to do. However, all the other investigations will depend on the suspected underlying etiology and the complications, which I will not be discussing today. But when you come to your final years, during the lectures, we will be talking about different conditions and the relevant investigation for each condition. Okay, so now towards the end of my presentation, we'd, I'd like to go back to uh, my first slide where I showed you uh, four scenarios. So the first scenario was a 68-year-old female who had oliguria and a palpable bladder. So here, you, I mean, it's very easy for us to think about all the hi-fi conditions and start investigating patients, but we always need to be uh, very aware about the simple things and exclude simple reasons for oliguria rather than straight away jumping into diagnosing hi-fi conditions. So here, this is very likely a catheter leak, catheter kink, because this patient has a palpable bladder, so which means the patient's producing urine, but there's a kink in the catheter, so it's simply a matter of uh, uh, adjusting that kink, and then you have a urine output, and no, no more investigations are necessary along the uh, in, in the direction of oliguria. If you take the second patient, this is this patient uh, is a patient who's having hypertension coming with a fracture neck of femur with hypotension and significant hemorrhage. So here you can see that this is hemorrhagic shock and the patient's got a low blood pressure and all the mechanisms that I discussed in the first few slides, the physiological mechanisms, of your uh, glucosagomerular feedback mechanism, sympathetic overactivities, your ADH hypersecretion, all those activities are trying to preserve more and more water in the body to maintain the circulation. So there, the, as a compensation, the kidney is going to produce less and less urine because the body is trying to reabsorb all this urine and also minimize the GFR. So here, the oliguria is secondary to hemorrhagic shock uh, uh, secondary to hypovolemia. Then the third uh, uh, scenario was a patient coming with a vasculitic rash with hypertension. And here again, this patient is oliguric. Now here, it's very obvious that with vascular, vasculitic rash, hypertension, oliguria, we always need to think about a intrinsic cause of acute kidney injury such as vasculitis affecting the glomerulus and or, or the blood vessels causing uh, oliguria 
So here, it's most likely this is a candida vasculitis and all the investigations in the lines of vasculitis needs to be done to identify the cause. And the final patient was a patient who was coming with a, with a diagnosis of ovarian cancer, abdominal distension, and again having oliguria. So here it's very likely that this ovarian cancer has invaded the ureters and is causing obstruction distally and giving rise to oliguria secondary to a post-obstructive acute kidney injury. So here you can see that these are four different cases, different reasons giving rise to oliguria, and we need to have a clear pathway of approach to identify the cause and do the relevant investigations. So with that being said, I'd like to, start, uh, I'd like to conclude my presentation here. And the whole objective of today's presentation was to uh, alert you to the symptom of oliguria. Remember the physiological mechanisms that results in oliguria and also the pathological conditions that give rise to oliguria because this is one of the commonest symptoms you would encounter in your day-to-day -day medical ward rounds, surgical ward rounds, whatever the speciality, oliguria is something that you need to know how to approach. So i would stop with this slide again. Oliguria can be secondary to physiological mechanisms where our body is trying to compensate for your volume losses, your pre renal causes. And oliguria also can be secondary to acute kidney injury, secondary to intrinsic and obstructive causes where there is a pathological process going on in the kidneys. Thank you.